better together. A few months ago, I learned that this is an apt description of the draft horse, the remarkably strong animal so often used in human history for plowing and other heavy labor, for hauling freight, for example. And I do mean heavy. A typical draft horse is able to pull 8,000 pounds, more than four times its weight. But what makes draft horses especially remarkable is their ability to carry heavy loads together. Even if you're not a math major, you could probably estimate one draft horse, 8,000 pounds, two draft horses, 16,000 pounds. No, actually, two of them together can, uh, can pull 24,000 pounds, and if properly trained, 32,000 pounds, more than 10 times their weight. They are definitely better together. And we are better together, too. This is one of the things we've been learning in our President's Chapels this year. In every aspect of our discipleship, there is something uniquely valuable about corporate spiritual formation, praying together, worshiping together, listening to the Word of God together, sharing the gospel together, and so on. Yes, and this morning, I want to add doing mercy to the list, serving God together through deeds of mercy and justice, which is something this world so desperately needs. You sometimes feel that the brokenness around you is overwhelming. Warfare, terrorism, poverty, famine, abuse, oppression, injustice, it affects billions all over the world, including in our natural environment. Honestly, what can one Christian do? It seems so little that sometimes we don't even try. But when we stand side by side, we discover that we are stronger together than we ever imagined. And when we show mercy together, we are able to pull a heavier load. Amen. I want to rem remind you this morning how important mercy and justice are to the heart of God. I want to do it by retelling this Bible story that probably isn't so familiar. You heard it read for you this morning. In December of 518 BC, by our reckoning, God's man, Zechariah, delivered a prophecy that pertained to a particular religious question that I think has, in its general terms, a lot of relevance for us. A delegation had come from Bethlehem up to Jerusalem, and they wanted some clarification about something that perplexed them. They asked the priests and the prophets this question, should I weep and abstain in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? Well, obviously, we need to understand the backstory. The Jewish community had only very recently returned to Jerusalem after 70 years of captivity in Babylon. If you know your Old Testament, you know this is one of the most traumatic things that ever happened to the people of God. The terrible siege of the city of Jerusalem, the deportation of its leaders, most of its citizens carried into exile in what today we would know as Baghdad. And for decades, they lived far from their rightful home. And the Jewish community in those days had a very particular way of remembering their beloved city and lamenting the things that had happened to them. They observed various days of fasting. It was a day when they would refrain from food and drink for the purpose of prayer and lamentation. And year after year, they fasted on these days, one, one for the day Jerusalem was captured, one for the day the walls were burned, and so on. And the community in Bethel started thinking about this, and they wondered whether it was still necessary to keep fasting on the day that the temple was destroyed. And the reason for this is that now the temple was rebuilt. You remember that when the Jews returned to Jerusalem, the first thing they did under Nehemiah was to rebuild the city walls, and then they rebuilt a house for the worship of God. And it raised a religious question, at least in the minds of some. Now that the temple has been reconstructed, do we really need to keep lamenting its destruction? 
to fast or not to fast? That was their question. And in his reply, Zechariah did something that we often see Jesus doing in the Gospels. People come with a question, and rather than answering it directly, the prophet uses their question to, as an opportunity to say something that he really felt needed to be said about their spiritual condition. Here's how he starts. It's with a soul-searching question. When you fasted and when you mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh month for those 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? Was it really for God? See, the prophet is asking about their spiritual motivation. And when they worshiped, in this particular case, by fasting, were they really doing it for God? And now we come to a question I think is highly relevant for every one of us. When we come to chapel, when we go to God in prayer, when we sing God's praise, when we set aside perhaps certain holy days for sacred worship, are we truly focused on the living God or more focused in various ways on ourselves? Is the worship God-centered or self-centered? Is the worship leading God-centered or self-centered? Are we more concerned about what we are giving to God or more concerned about what we are getting or, as it seems to us, not getting out of it. Well, according to Zechariah, the people of God had lost their focus. Here's how he says it in verse 6. When you eat and when you drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? It's a rhetorical question identifying what the problem had been for the people of God all along. And I, I would say it's really the problem the people of God have all the way through history. He goes on in verse 7 to refer to the days before the Jews ended up in Babylon, that before their exile, the good old days when Jerusalem was inhabited, when the city was prosperous, and rather than focusing on God in those days and listening to what he had to say, they, here's how Zechariah says it in verse 11, they refused to pay attention. They turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear lest they should hear the words that the Lord had sent by his spirit. You know, this can happen in the human heart. You know that God has something to say, but you really don't want to hear it. So you turn your shoulder a bit, harden your heart a bit, deafen your ear a bit. It was for those reasons that God visited judgment against Israel through the armies of Babylon. He scattered them among the nations. The pleasant land was made desolate, and it was all because the people of God did not do what God said. Specifically, they did not show mercy or justice. Listen to these words, what God wanted them to obey. Render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Don't oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. Let none of you devise evil against one another in your heart. By saying this, the prophet wanted to reorganize Israel's priorities, and by the testimony and scripture of the Holy Spirit, it's an opportunity for God to reorganize our priorities as well, which frankly is not always what we want God to do. People in those days were focused on a particular aspect of worship, a specific service for a specific day, and they were asking about that. And eventually God answers that question. You can read about it in Zechariah 8. Uh, God wanted to turn the day of fasting into a day of feasting. But before he got into any of that, he had a higher priority for us. God was less concerned about religious rituals and more concerned about mercy and justice. Here's how the Bible puts it. Our worship is not pleasing to God unless we also show mercy. Fasting or not fasting, that's not really the question. Doing justice or not doing justice, that is the question. The prophet Samuel put this in a positive way. To obey is better than sacrifice, meaning worship. To listen is better than the fat of rams, that is, religious acts of, of ritual sacrifice and offering. Other prophets were much more critical than that. Samuel was pretty positive. Isaiah said this. He said, look, you only fast to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. 
Fasting like yours will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? Amos was even more scathing. Do you know these words from Amos chapter 5? I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your offerings, I will not accept them. I will not even look on them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. What do you suppose God would say about our chapel services or about our worship in a local church or any of our other gatherings for worship? Does he love them or hate them? And you see, the answer to that question doesn't just depend on what we do here. It also depends maybe as much, maybe even more on the way we talk about one another on campus or on what we do or don't do for people beyond our campus who need our help. Don't you sometimes wish some of the words of Isaiah and Amos weren't even in the Bible so you didn't even have to worry about them? To help us do more justice, Zechariah tells us very specifically the kind of mercy that God has in mind. Let me repeat, render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Don't oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. Let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. And these are words for all of us, how God calls all of us to treat all of us without exception. The word another comes up a number of times in those verses. It's a reminder that we should treat the people right around us with fairness and respect. We should never do evil to anyone. We should always be kind to everyone. This is what God expects from all of his people for all of his people without exception. And that's especially true if we live in a covenant community like this one. But for all of that one anothering, it's so obvious, isn't it, that God has an unmistakable concern for people on the margins. And here he mentions several groups. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list, but he mentions some of the people most likely to get overlooked in Jerusalem and frankly, most likely to get overlooked today pretty much anywhere in the world. He mentions people without power or influence, people with limited means, with, with limited prospects for improving their situation in life, people who are likely to get exploited if they aren't protected. Zechariah mentions widows, women who had lost their husbands, as was so common in the ancient world, and who in that cult culture suffered from a lack of protection and provision. He mentions the fatherless, orphans who didn't have a father or mother, a mom or a dad. He mentions sojourners, migrants, immigrants, other temporary residents. These were people who didn't know the language, who, who didn't understand the culture, usually ended up on the outside of everything. He mentions the poor, which includes anyone who didn't have enough, who struggled to meet daily needs. And of course, all of these people are still with us, even if we use different names for some of them today. Single mothers, Foster children, refugees, they all need help. And what God wants to know is not whether you're going to worship him or not. What he wants to, to know is whether you're going to show them mercy or do them justice. That's the point of Zechariah and Amos and Isaiah and all the prophets. And notice, again, so clearly, so obviously, God has both mercy and justice in mind. Show kindness. That's a, a mercy command. It's a, it's a call to be proactive in caring for others, noticing their needs, showing them compassion, whether we frankly think they deserve it or not. It's not a qualification Zechariah gives. Some of the other words and phrases here fall more under the category of justice. Render true judgments. Do not oppress. You see, mercy and justice go hand in hand. 
Zechariah is using them pretty much interchangeably. We need to care for people in the situation they're in. That's merciful. And we also need to get people out of a bad situation if we can and keep them from ever getting there in the first place. That is just. These are not secondary priorities for God. They are primary priorities. And we know this because mercy and justice get mentioned all the way through scripture. I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples. I wanna reinforce the point cumulatively. Zechariah seems to be getting, and this is what some of the commentators say, some of his wording from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah preached a generation earlier specifically to Jerusalem in the days leading up to its siege and captivity. And, and he had this, this complaint against them. They judge not with justice the cause of the fatherless. They don't defend the rights of the needy. That's Jeremiah 5. Jeremiah 7, he says, execute justice one with another. Don't oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow. He's working with these same categories. But of course, Zechariah also read about mercy and justice in the law of Moses. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Don't mistreat any widow or fatherless child, Exodus 22. And those are just a few examples. There are others. Maybe Micah 6.8 comes to your mind. He has shown you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Yes. These are not minor themes in the Old Testament. They're major themes. And of course, we see the same thing in the New Testament. You turn to the Gospels, you see Jesus always seeming to be helping a woman who had nowhere else to turn, rescuing somebody from the conditions of poverty, reaching out to people from other backgrounds, including people no one else would even touch. I think Jesus did mercy and justice every day of his public ministry and expects the same from us. The Apostle James said it like this, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is what? To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is God's command because it is God's character. The reason mercy and justice are so high in his priority list for us is because mercy and justice are essential to his eternal being. What kind of God do we serve? He's merciful and gracious. He's abounding in steadfast love. He's, he judges the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. These are all repeated themes in Holy Scripture. And our calling as Christians is to live righteously according to the character of our God. Amen. If all of that Sounds a little complicated. Jesus, put these cookies right on the bottom shelf. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Simply put, we are God's hands and feet in the world, which is a calling we can only fulfill if we also have God's heart for the hurting and the broken. And I mention all of this and take the time just to recite some of the biblical priority here because I find mercy and justice have a tendency to move further down our priority list. They tend to slide. And I think it's partly because it comes so naturally for us to do things for ourselves and much less naturally to do things for others. Mercy gets messy. Getting involved in somebody else's life, another to help that person without hurting that person is terribly inconvenient. It's much easier for us to look out for ourselves, besides which doing what is truly equitable can often be to our own disadvantage. And just try in this world getting people the justice they deserve. It is endlessly frustrating. Yes. Showing mercy, doing justice, those are just about the costliest things that one human being can do for another human being. They always require sacrifice. I was reminded of that just this morning so painfully reading the news that Pastor Antoine Lenoir of Westview Baptist Church in Miami-Dade just weeks ago, just last week, was stabbed and killed by a man he was trying to help. But we have a Savior who was willing to pay that cost. 
And to keep mercy and justice up where they belong on our priority list, we need to remember how important they are to God, how essential to his character, how central in his scriptures. And we can have all kinds of debates and discussions about the best way to do that, about the best way to pursue justice in the world, the role of government in the church, which policies truly are in the best interests of immigrants and the poor. What's the relationship between personal and systemic justice and injustice? We can talk about all of those things and reach greater biblical clarity, but there shouldn't be any question about the priority that God wants us to place on doing justice and showing mercy. There's another tendency we need to fight against, and that is the needless bifurcation between gospel words and gospel deeds, between showing mercy and doing evangelism. I wonder if you've noticed that, at least sometimes, Christians more focused on justification, the righteousness we proclaim as a gift, when we share the gospel. Some Christians are more more focused on that. Others are more focused on justice, the righteousness we display when we do what is righteous for those who are exploited or oppressed. It's a false dichotomy. Let me say it this way. The God of justifying righteousness is also the God of righteous justice. It's the same God all the way through scripture. The God who justifies the ungodly is the same God who loves to do justice which means justification Christians ought to be justice Christians too, and vice versa. We care both about the salvation of souls and the well-being of people's bodies. And we do it all better when we do it together. I praise God there are so many ways to get involved in showing mercy and doing justice through Wheaton College. Go on hunger. Do service projects with your music ensemble or your varsity sport. Do WFMP or Honduras Project. Join Voice for Life. Get involved with International Justice Mission. There are so many opportunities on this campus. But to be honest, many of us are less involved in mercy and justice than we could be and likely ought to be. Maybe we don't care that much, or maybe we care, but not quite enough to get involved. My challenge for you is very simple. Find one way, just one way to show more mercy. Do it once, I think you'll want to do it again. Whether it's through a campus ministry or through a project or church, at church or a really good way to spend the next summer, find a way, find something to care about and then find a way to contribute. Serve unwed mothers, feed people who don't have a home, care for people with disabilities, welcome immigrants to to your community. There are more there than you probably realize. Don't back away, but move towards people who suffer hardship. And all of that is so much easier and more effective when we do it together. The world's injustice is a heavy load. In a way, it's the load Jesus carried to the cross and also the load he empowers us to carry for him into the world together by rendering true judgments, showing kindness and mercy, caring for the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, the poor. Father in heaven, we pray for the heart that you have for the needs of the world, and we pray for the empowering grace of the Holy Spirit who enables us not only to care, but also to do something that matters. This is the prayer we offer for the Wheaton College community, faculty, staff, students, and our alumni in the world today. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.